Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream again, if you're just turning in. Uh, we've been laboring through Romans uh, chapter 2, if you'll turn there this morning. And I, I guess that's a good word, is, is labor you know, with a baby. I, I've never experienced it myself, but I've watched it five times and it looks really painful. <laughs> uh, amazing pain and anguish to give birth to that sweet little child. And I would always say, shoo, we're, we're done having children. You know, Laura's never going to want another child after this the rest of her life. And in a month or so, she'd say, man, I could really go for another one. You're like, why? Why would, why would anyone want to do that again? And it's because of what was birthed. It, it far outweighed the cost of all the pain of labor. And so I, 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 I've seen these little shirts. I survived the coronavirus of 2020, which is just boasting. You don't know that yet. But I, I want a shirt for any of you who make shirts again. I survived Romans 2. Today, we finished Romans chapter 2, and I'm still breathing just barely and alive. We've been laboring in Romans 2. And Paul is undoing the unbeliever and the religious and the self-righteous hypocrite. Because we all have a hangover from being an Adam, the light has been painful and purifying and refining and good for the children of God. As I said earlier, I'm not a hypocrite but I have hypocrisy that remains and I fight and I battle and what I want is just a pure heart. And that's what we will look at this morning. But the reason that we're doing this, uh, the reason we've lost maybe half of our listeners is this is God's path to the joy of, of a newborn, of one born again and one endowed with salvation. It's the journey that we all must walk to the cross to find salvation for our souls. Salvation will not come to the one who just needs a little bit of help. The one that hopes God graves on a curve. The one that thinks his religion kind of makes God smile at him. A good person. Jesus plus whatever I can do, my law keeping. It will only come to the one who finds himself in Romans 1 through 2, what we've looked at. And you can't look to anything in your hands, any merit to save you. You're so lost and broken and desperate and under the wrath of God. It's just all you can do is call upon the name of the Lord. If you give me anything other than that, I can't do it. All I can do is call, oh Jesus, save me. Save me, I'm a a sinner. And that's Romans 10. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the labor that Paul has taken us through to bring us to the birth, the sweet place of being born again unto the living God. So this morning we come to the climax of God dealing with the Jews, the the religious hypocrite. The truth that bankrupted me many, many decades ago and brought me to Christ savingly. It's the reason that I, I could not keep the law. It was because of my heart My heart did not love the lawgiver. And that's the essence of the whole thing. I was at enmity with him and his ways and his persons trying to keep his law while my heart hates him. That's not a marriage. I kept trying to change my actions to keep his law and, and do everything he asked me to do in his law. But I just couldn't change my heart. Jeremiah said, can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin or the leopard changes spots, neither can you who are accustomed to doing evil do what is right. You can't change your nature. You can't change your heart. Christ said it's not what goes into a man that defiles them, whether you clean your hands or eat with these regulations and laws, but it's, it's from what, what inside that defiles the man. From his heart flows the springs of life. And that's what defiles us is this heart that is wrong. External is not your problem. It's not work at religion and clean yourself up. The problem goes right into the inside, the internal, the heart. So what I've learned from Jesus and Paul here in Romans and in my own life is that the immoral can quickly see their need of a Savior. God just kind of clicks and the lights come on and they're like, I am the greatest of sinners who's ever lived. John Newton. But the moral can heal Many gospel bullets, and I've been even lobbing grenades at you. I'm a good person. 
boom, like Superman. Bullets are bouncing off your chest. The religious pedigree of Paul that I read at the beginning of this service in Philippians can block many gospel attempts. You can heal yourself with your morality and the things that you're doing. So Paul is going hard after his brethren, the Jews, <coughs> so that they could be saved from their hypocrisy, all external with no internal. He's loving them. I wish that you could be saved. And he's just coming hard. And one way to do this last week, you're putting yourself under the law. Here's the law and, and you don't even keep it. God's law demands perfection. James says you break it in one spot, you break the whole thing. And so I, I do, I, I know the law has been done in history. It's finished. But these Jews are still putting themselves under it. Paul says, oh, you want to put yourself under it? Uh, keep it perfectly then. The principles still apply. The rich young ruler, how can I be saved? Keep the commands. I've kept all of them. Jesus listed all the second tablets except one of the commands. And he, I kept all of them. That, method, that methodology bounced off real quick for a moralist. Here, go keep the law. I've done it. So Paul, as he often does, gets right to the heart of the problem. Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. The one command he didn't say is do not covet. And if he would have said don't covet, he would have said, I've done that. I haven't done that. And Jesus says, go sell everything and you'll find out your heart is filled with covetousness. And Paul's doing the same thing. He's going after the heart. Why can, man, why can no man keep the law? since it was given to Moses. Why is it a ministry of death? Why can no person ever be justified by the works of the law? Why did it go away and it's done in history now? Come on, Romans 7, 12, he says, for the law is holy, it's righteous and it's good. Revealed true, uh, righteousness. In Romans 3.21, it says, in the law, the righteousness was revealed. There was nothing wrong with the law. Paul never said there was something wrong with the law. There was something so right with it that it demanded a heart that loved God and followed after his commands. A true son. Here's how a true son should live, and here's the law's. The problem is not what the law commanded or what it revealed. The problem was who it was given to. It was given to fallen people with hearts that are hard and far away from God. That's where everything broke down. There's a perfect law given to someone who hates the lawgiver and is just going to break it. There's where the problem came. That's the problem. No heart for God. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. There's never been a better heart ever in love to God when Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the whole law. The fulfillment that Christ gave to this law, the law of Christ. What's the greatest command? To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the others like it, to love your neighbor as your own self. There's never been anyone who's fulfilled that perfectly but Jesus Christ. Without it, no hope under law. No one could have a right heart and thus live the right way to God. It's impossible. By the law, no flesh will be justified. He says all it did was give you a knowledge of sin. It showed you what sin was and it shows you that your heart is at enmity to God. That's what the law did. Why did Jesus say to the Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is filthy. Do all your external religions and laws and rituals and ceremonial stuff, but inside you got a dirty heart and it just, it's filthy. All religion is outside and external looking for the approval of man, but not the heart looking for the approval of God. The worst marriage I've ever seen is law given to a heart at enmity with the one who gave it to you. That's a bad marriage. So do you see the beauty of what Paul then is doing in Romans 2? In 2, 1 through 4, he's going after the heart. You, you judge others. You're not saying approval like the Gentiles and their sin. You're, you're judging everyone. <clears throat> but you do the same thing. 
In verse 4, your heart is so hard that you think the kindness and patience and tolerance of God is that he's okay with you and you don't repent. That's what your hard heart does. Just thinks, okay, God's happy with me because he's patient. Why? Romans 2, 5, because you have a stubborn and an unrepentant heart. That's what you come into this world with. It's stubborn. It's unrepentant. It doesn't love God. It hates him. And then this great contrast he gives us in chapter 2 of of judgment. And he says there's two different hearts. And the one is selfishly ambitious. It's this heart that is just so selfish that it just, that's all it seeks. That's all it can go after. And he said the other heart, this redeemed heart, seeks for glory and honor and immortality. I, I, I can't make my heart do that. No one can seek for, I just want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Your your heart will always be selfishly ambitious. That's what it was born, and it will always seek that. And then in 2.16, he's the judge of what? The secrets of men, the heart. You can't hide your evil heart by law and morality. Judgment Day, he says, is going to go right into the secrets of the thing that's wrong, your heart. And it's going to show all your thoughts and evil intentions. Even though you had external religion and everything looked nice, I'm going to go right in there and show you what was in your heart. And then in verses 17 through 24, all your teaching and preaching, keep telling everybody, but because of your heart, you just keep doing the opposite of everything you teach. And now this morning, Paul's going to hold nothing back. And he's going to come after the Jews harder than anything he has said thus far in this chapter. So put your seatbelts on. He's going to go to the heart of the matter. And oh, the beauty of Paul's progression and argument this morning. And so I would like to pray and ask God to meet us here. Oh, Father, we stand on holy ground. God, if I could preach one message to the whole world, it would be this. I pray that everyone listening now, Lord, that your spirit would take these truths and go right into the heart. If there are any listening who all they've ever done is covered themselves with externals, could today be the day of their visitation, oh God? Take away stony hearts and give them hearts of flesh. God, I pray for my sweet believers who have new hearts and they're so frustrated with the sin that remains in the flesh that fights against it. God, let them treasure that there is a heart. Let them be encouraged. And would you set our hearts aflame uh, more for you this morning? But God, you're going after those with no heart. I pray, use your word to do what only you can do. God, let the labor give birth this morning to be born again into the kingdom of God. Amen. Your outline for this morning, in Romans 2, 25 through 29, Paul shows us two different realities in respect to righteousness. And we're going to look at our first point is is ritualism. I'll call that externalism, and Paul's going to call it uncircumcision. And then we're going to look at regeneration. And that's the internal. That's the new heart we're going to look at. And that's what Paul's going to call the true circumcision. And so let's look at our first point then, the ritualism. Verses 25 through 27. And what I'd like to do as we begin, just labor with me. There's a lot in this passage. And I had to cut out five pages of notes this morning. And I still got way too many. So just come with me. Let's journey before God and his word. Let's start with what was circumcision in the Old Testament? And then how a Jew in Paul's day thought about circumcision. And then I want to look at what is the fulfillment of the new covenant? What does God say uh, is circumcision for us as believers in this day and age? So first, what was circumcision? Early in our Bibles, after the fall, God promised to start a remedy. Salvation in Genesis 3. And it's that restoration promised through the seed of Eve. And a little bit later, then he calls out Abraham and begins from the land of Ur. <clears throat> Genesis 12, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham. 
And then in chapter 15, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. And, and so uh, in that cutting of the covenant, just to, to save a, a little, well, now I'm going to actually read it. Sorry. I was going to save you some time. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. <clears throat> Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar in Damascus. And Abraham said, Since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born in my house as my heir. I don't have an heir yet. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, so shall be your heir. And he took him outside and he said, Now look toward the heavens. And count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed in the Lord. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness, which is going to be a foundation of the whole gospel. And Paul's going to use that again and again through Romans. Paul will make a big deal out of this promise that Abraham believed God, that he would bless the seed and the nations. And he credited it to him as righteousness. And I want you to hear this. It happened before the sign of circumcision, which is going to come in chapter 17, 15 years later. And so faith in God's promise, Abraham believed and God cuts a covenant. And you remember, I've gone over it before, but he cuts the animals in half and two parties would walk through to keep the covenant and Abraham's sleeping and God alone walks through those pieces to say, I will keep all the requirements of the covenant to bless you and the nations. Just the gospel right there. I will do it all. And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And now come to chapter 17 of Genesis. The sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham now is given. And the sign is going to be circumcision. And the nations will be blessed by your seed, Jesus, but the blessing of of being the covenant people of God. Circumcision was a sign of the faith of Abraham to love God and walk in his ways and be a distinctive people, the people of God. And so circumcision was this external mark of an internal reality of the people of God, the faith that Abraham had. So here's the mark. And it was a distinctive mark of the chosen people of God. And so we will see it today in the new covenant is where this whole sermon will move. There's a distinctive mark for the people of God called circumcision of the heart. And in Leviticus 13, it said all were to be circumcised in the Mosaic law on the eighth day, all would be circumcised with the mark of circumcision for the identity to be the people of Israel. And the mark, again, is belonging to the Mosaic covenant in that command. <clears throat> Secondly, then, how was thir- that circumcision then thought about by the Jew now as Paul is writing this? And what happened as it evolved is circumcision was now your pass to heaven. You belong to the people of God by this mark. No matter what your heart was, it didn't matter. You just needed the mark. And the, the writings from this time, I studied and I was going to quote a whole bunch of them, but I'm just going to summarize all the quotes I saw, is that in that day they would write, no person that is circumcised will ever go to Gehenna. If you're circumcised, you can't go to hell. The possession of the law and the mark of the flesh was enough. And it made you the people of God. You you were were saved by having Torah and having the circumcision. And those are the two things that Paul's going after in our chapter. So their boast was, we got Torah. We bear the mark of circumcision. We are God's people. Though their heart was far from him throughout in Isaiah and Jeremiah, your, your heart isn't even close to me. And he kept saying, circumcise your heart, even in the Old Testament. This Abraham did not do. So Paul, what is this talk of salvation by faith? A a righteousness, not your own, given to you that will save you from the wrath of God. (laughs) How could we Jews circumcised with Torah ever be under the judging wrath of God? We're the children of Abraham. What's wrong with you, Paul? So Paul is going after the unsaved Jew this morning. And he will get into their own bunker and dismantle their confidence that they would not be judged by God on the last day because of their covenant of circumcision and bloodline. 
And so let's take up then our first point uh, with that background. So our first point is ritualism. And let's begin in verse 25. Romans 2, 25. <clears throat> For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you're a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And so we'll start with the key question is, what is it that matters to God in regards to circumcision? And like everything in this chapter, it has some value for sure. There's value in it. It would mark out the one who was committed to God and following in his ways, the Mosaic covenant, the faith of Abraham. And it would identify the people of God and, and Israel, the, the commitment to be God's people and to follow Torah. But notice what, what Paul tells us is uh, in verse 25, uh, your, what value is it if you're a transgressor of the law? Is it profitable <laughs> if, if you're not obedient to God? The mark meant that you belonged to God. It's an identifying mark, a sign of membership into the covenant community of God's people. The mark of the, of the relationship then, devotion and service to God. It, it, it wasn't just some mark. A, you're a kingdom of priests and kings. You're, you're a, a nation that is given to the service of God. Circumcision was the mark that this is the kind of people that we are. We're God's people. And it simply meant that you belonged to God and you were devoted to Yahweh. You were accepted of God and you walked with God. But says Paul, if you're a transgressor of the law, then your circumcision has become uncircumcision. This is an amazing statement, which is, which is where many in Israel had drifted in most of Paul's day. All it was was just this external mark and you're disobeying. You have no heart for God. You're living any way you want. You're hypocrites. You're teaching, do something, and you're doing the opposite. You're judging everybody and doing the same thing. So this may not mean much to us, but to a Jew, what Paul just said is massive. He's saying you're uncircumcised then, which means what? You're regarded as one who's outside the covenant with Abraham. You are a pagan Gentile dog. You're unclean. You don't belong to God. You just couldn't have said anything worse to a Jew in that day. Paul's going right for the heart this morning. Don't let that go by lightly. This meant you are a child of destruction. This is what uncircumcision meant to them. <clears throat> Do you see why they wanted to cut his head off? This isn't friendship evangelism. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Paul's going right in. I mean, he's shooting. And Paul is saying this ritual that you're relying upon for your salvation it's only as good as the heart and the life behind it, the, the faith of Abraham. And very much what, to help us this morning, it would be like baptism for us, the, the sign of me entering into the new covenant, that I have faith and I'm entering in this way. And this is whether you get baptized, whether you're just wet or whether you've been saved and you just publicly declared what God has already done. So faith. And the commitment to follow Jesus is what gives life to baptism. Baptism is just a ritual if there's no heart and no reality to what you're testifying to. Circumcision the same way. And so people today think baptism saves them. They thought circumcision saved them. And Paul's just going right after it this morning. I heard this example, and I'll try to help. A wedding ring. It's, a, it's an honorable thing. I, one of my favorite things is standing on an altar giving those rings and exchanging them. I remember you two doing it, Taylor and Haley. It's beautiful. It's just a metal token that you put on at a wedding, but the ring is a reminder of your vow and your commitment to this man or this woman, to fidelity and purity. It's a single-minded devotion to this person. But what if that ring is worn by an adulterer? And then the ring is worthless. Whatever that ring represents, it's false. It's why God called Israel an adulterous people. It does no good. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what circumcision was supposed to mean. You have a wrong heart and devotion to God. You have the heart of an adulteress and you're chasing other gods. It means nothing. God's saying that ring is worthless and so is your circumcision. Take that ring off and throw it away. That's what Paul's saying here. Your circumcision is worthless. 
The Jew did not have what Abraham had, faith and grace alone. And now a love for God and devotion to him with a new heart. If that is not there, you're just as good as uncircumcised. And you're as good as unbaptized. If that's all it is. So what is it that matters? 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. And I'm going to flush that out, but it's a new heart. Look with me into verse 26. So, <clears throat> if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? So here we go with an if. If a Gentile, he says, keeps the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So stop, Paul. Don't you dare say that. You're on holy ground. You're saying that uncircumcision is unnecessary? That circumcision is unnecessary? That's been the history of Israel. It's commanded on the eighth day. You're a heretic. The Gentile will be counted as though he was circumcised, which means belonging to God. They're, they're going to be counted as if they belong to God. If I had to summarize this, what he's saying is ritual doesn't matter. What matters is the heart, which is this whole book, is the obedience of faith. And we're, I'm going to keep fleshing it out week after week after week, but that's what he's getting at. The obedience of faith is going to be this new heart that believes in Jesus alone, obeys the command to trust and believe, and lives a life of reality out of our acceptance with God. That's what's going to matter. So right here, though, it says this, the man who keeps the requirements of the law, though he be uncircumcised, is going to be credited to him as if he belonged to God. And saying that the uncircumcised Gentile who keeps the requirements of the law that doesn't have the physical mark of circumcision will find a favorable reckoning before God. He will be regarded, it's ogitsomai, as belonging to God. And so Paul uh, points so far, the physical mark is not what matters, but how one has responded to the revealed will of God, the, the faith and the obedience that flows from it. And in verse 27, he just he takes it even further, um, that if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of it? So the physically uncircumcised Gentile if he fulfills the law, which we're going to see that obedience of faith, will he not judge you, Jew, with Torah and circumcision, and, and you're just a transgressor of the law? And the Jews believed that they were righteous, and they would sit in judgment upon the wicked, which is what they were already doing in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. They're judging all the Gentiles. And we know at the end, we're going to judge all the nations. We're the righteous ones. We're, we're, we'll judge the Gentiles. We're privileged. We got law and circumcision. We look at the Gentiles and their behavior and we just point it out and judge them and condemn them. It just, it all of a sudden, here's that boomerang again. It all comes back full circle, what Paul is saying. You, the Jew, who judges others who sin while doing the same things, you teach them and do the same things. The Gentile who has a true circumcision, he's been saved, has the obedience of faith, He's going to be judging you on the last day. You, you will be, you'll be judged by the ones you considered unclean. Oh my. Having the law and ritualism with a hard heart cannot save you. And he's going to take it a step further of, of the way to find favor with God. And, and um, you might be trying this morning many different ways. It could be baptism. It could just be your church going or all your doctrine. It's all you have is external things. And I'm telling you, since I've been a pastor, there are people who sit in the church every week and it's just external. And it's almost like a, a Jew who went Judaism. That was your life. That was what you did. Yours is just, you go to church on Sunday, you go Sunday night, you go to pie fellowship on Wednesday. It's just a cultural thing. And everything is just external. And you, you don't have the new heart. And that's what Paul's after. Is he doesn't want any Jew or any Gentile to die 
with ritual and no reality. So just think being around Christianity makes you a Christian. He doesn't want anyone to come short of the true circumcision of Jesus Christ who offers eternal life to all who will come with nothing in their hands to him and him alone. So our second point then is what is it that really matters? And the answer is a new heart. And so regeneration, to be born again, to be made new from the inside to the outside, that's Christianity. Inside out, not outside. Same message to Nicodemus, religious Pharisee, what must I do to be saved? You must be born again to enter in the kingdom of God. You need a new heart. The stream will always be dirty until you clean the fount. So come with me to pure gold. What was the issue of chapter 1? It isn't just that you broke the law and you're condemned, but verse 21 says your foolish heart was darkened because you know from creation there's a God and that foolish heart is darkened. And it says your heart sees it and it will not give glory to God and give thanks. The problem of chapter 1 is a hard heart that won't give God glory. It's the only response to creation. Here's my heart, God. And in chapter 2, the problem's your heart. I, w- I want that. I, I, I don't just want the externals of religion. You're, you're, you're blocking God with externals, and he's saying, I want the heart. And so the fulfillment of the whole law is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. A new heart. And you never get a glimpse of that with the heart that you have from Adam that is committed to self-love. And so not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Why? Why can't I fulfill the law? Because of my heart. Do you feel desperate? (laughs) No one has ever been able to change their heart. We have all the power to make nuclear weapons and do all these things, but no one has ever been able to change their heart. The Jews couldn't and the Gentiles couldn't. Your heart can sin with morality or immorality, with general revelation or special revelation. He's just encompassing every human being who's ever lived. You can't change your heart, and that's what God wants. I can have a perfect law that requires perfect obedience, and it just can't change my heart. I stand condemned and unable to fix my problem. I can't change my nature. I can't change my heart, my cardia. I'm a beggar before God with no power. The law can't fix this baby. So let me ask you this. Who are the Gentiles that could fulfill the law? Is there such a creature? Or is this just a hypothetical? If if a Gentile could do this, Or is this just showing you that you have to keep the law to be the people of God and and to point you to the one who did? I, I just can't find anything in the text that's leading me there. And secondly, if there is such a one who could keep the law, doesn't that contradict where Paul's taken this whole section that no one can ever be justified by the works of the law? That's his whole argument. That's where he's leading. So it surely does, if this is talking about being justified by the works of the law before God, the whole thing breaks. No way is that what he's saying. So what is going on here? And I'm going to give you my best answer. I think the text gives us the answer. If you look in verse 28, four, again, you don't start sentences with four, explanatory, the connection. Paul's now going to explain the Gentiles who fulfill the law that will be counted as God's people and have eternal life. You better answer that for us, Paul. How can that be? And Paul's going to explain it right now. How does the obedience of this Gentile ever come about? What is this whole epistle about? The whole Bible, it's about a true circumcision. The whole thing is about a new heart and it's, it's hidden nature. This this circumcision is not outward. Those are not what distinguish the children of God. Not what church, heritage from Abraham, ethnic descent, culture, distinctives, nor circumcision. It's not external. It's not the ritual things. It's inward. That's what I love about this gospel. The Jew, he says, is one inwardly with the faith of Abraham. It's the same Greek word in Romans 2, 16, the secrets of the heart, the the inside, the internals. 
So it's not just a Jew outwardly, but one inwardly. It's, it's the hidden and the secret part. Remember Matthew 6? You know, don't just do what the Pharisees do and sound the trumpet and, and here I'm giving, look at everybody and look, I'm fasting so everybody knows, hear me, I'm standing on the corner praying, but go into the secret place and, and pray. And God has always said, I want the heart, I want the heart. It's me and you, it's relationship. It's not external stuff. It's not what men do, and that's what I call religion. But it's what God does. Are we justified by works? Not ours. Thank you, God. But we're justified by the works of Jesus Christ alone. And the work of the Spirit in us is to give us a heart to believe in Him, to receive Him, and to love Him and follow Him. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You, you can't fix your heart. The Holy Spirit must do it. And the whole new covenant, if you love me, Jesus said, you will do what? Keep my commands. And so when you get this new heart, you'll love me. And now you'll love following me and keeping my commands. They're not burdensome. You're going to love it. That's where Paul is going. That's the answer he will give us. In chapters 3 through 5, it's, it's what his son has done to get you justified and right with God. It's all there. It's all him, not one strand of us. And then in 6 through 8, how does the Spirit work out this new heart and give us obedience of faith? And it flows right out of justification. It flows out of our salvation. So all of Romans is going to explain what I'm trying so hard to do this morning. So hang in there. We've got like... 14 more chapters to figure this out. Sorry, my math. I was never good with numbers. That's why I got out of accounting. The essence of religion is outward, not the inward person of the heart. And where does this circumcision take place in the new covenant? The heart. The true Jew has a true circumcision on the inward. Not in the flesh, but in the heart. The core and center of the human soul, mission and control center. So please don't miss this. This is not new. God has always wanted the hearts of his people. That's the issue. Give me your heart, Adam. <laughs> if I had to give you a theme of Deuteronomy, I want you to hear this. It's the heart. Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and love him. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. I want your heart. I want your obedience from a heart. This has been the same desire since creation. God wants my whole heart. He wants wholehearted devotion. He cried out to Israel, circumcise your hearts. You people aren't listening to me. You're not following me. You're not loving me and trusting me. Your hearts need to be circumcised. And the law cannot do it. You can rub up against it all you want, but the law cannot circumcise a heart. It can only show your need of, want, of needing a circumcised heart so that you will flee to the only one who can give you a new heart. I will never be happy until all my kids have a heart for the Lord. And all my flock has a heart for the Lord. And all this world has a heart for God. I, jo I don't care about ritualism and moralism and, and all these external things. I just want a heart for God. And I want you to just see this is the fulfillment of God's promise of the whole new covenant. He's been saying this for thousands of years, telling you this is where it's all moving. And I'm just going to read three verses to show you this. Deuteronomy 36. <clears throat> Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. A circumcised heart loves God. <laughs> Jeremiah 31, a new covenant, 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke because they couldn't keep the law. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. 
I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it. And I will be their God, and they'll be my people. And they shall not teach again, for each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so I I will write it in your hearts by the work of Jesus Christ. And that law is going to go to the inside and you're going to get a circumcised heart. And now from within, I love God. And I just want to please him. I want to obey him. Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. How does such a surgery take place? A heart transplant, he said, is by the spirit, not by the letter. The letter, the law, you'll never be able to get a new heart. The only way is by the spirit of God taking out that stony heart and giving you a new heart. And the Jews were resting in their letter and in their ritual and the externals. And it just can't give you a heart for God. We have assemblies like that all over the world and they're the meanest people you'll ever meet. I've never met a true legalist who's kind. And it just, it'll always make you mean. And, and, and people on the, the, the brink of death in our country right now holding to the letter sitting here this morning because you've been raised in a Christian home and your heart is dead as a doornail before God. He wants you to see it and to call upon Jesus Christ and be saved. See that your heart's dead and don't let rest in ritualism and that you're raised in a Christian home and you're moral. And let it die this morning. That will not get you through judgment. The law cannot change you. You can study it and teach it and try to obey it like our chapter 2. But all it does is condemn you because the law was a call for your whole heart and your heart is stubborn and it's unrepentant. Your natural heart doesn't want to do anything. It will never love and submit to Almighty God. Can't even submit to it, he says later in Romans. You can't walk in the way that Paul describes here. By the Spirit, believing my gospel. This is what will bring the obedience of faith. Believing in Jesus, this new heart with new desires, law within. Now you can love. You can love God perfectly, no. But you're going to be growing in it and changing. And we'll journey in that in Romans. But uh, this is overwhelming to me. Salvation. Real Jewishness. He says it's not physical descent, Israel. It's not cutting your flesh. It's not having the tablets of stone or Abraham's blood running through your veins. But it's having Abraham's faith in your heart. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And those with the faith of Abraham will receive the righteousness offered in the gospel. And we are now the true people of God. Jew and Gentile believing upon the seed, the Christ. And Jesus and all now, the wall's broken down. He says, We're this, we are the people of God. You once weren't a people, now you are the people. Because in your heart, it's been circumcised and you have faith in the seed that God said he'd bless the nations by. And we are being blessed here this morning because we have the faith of Abraham looking to God and all his work in Jesus Christ, walking through the, those cut animals, doing everything in the covenant to make us acceptable. We are the people of God. And this person's praise is from God. Remember Romans 2, 7? It said the real believer is going to receive honor. (coughs) Honor is what you will get. Well done, good and faithful servant. You will get the praise from God. The secret things will be revealed of your heart. And though it's imperfect for sure, the one thing I know is it genuinely loves God. And what I hate most about my heart is the part that doesn't. The flesh that I let overcome and, and, and that the grows back over this heart. Um, I, I, ha- I have an incorruptible love that it cannot die because it's from God. You will receive, well done, good and faithful servant. 
not uh, you're, you're the, the name of God's being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of your unbelief and sin and recklessness and all that you're doing. It'll never be perfect, but it will be sincere. And what we're going to see in Romans is this, this circumcision will, will bring a whole new life to the child of God. John Newton said, The love I bear him is but a faint and feeble spark, but it's an emanation from himself. He kindled it. He circumcised my heart, and he keeps it alive. And because it is his work, I trust that many waters shall not quench it. And that's the testimony of every believer. I've been through so many things. I've had ups and I've had downs, but there's this love that God will not let be quenched. And I I, I treasure my new heart more than anything except Christ. I have a new heart and I want to, for from it flows the springs of life. Watch over it with all diligence. Uh, put, Put coal and fire through the word of God and fellowship and worship. The heart and the new covenant is the true religion. So this new heart, it loves and it boasts in Jesus Christ alone. We love Christ. As a, Rick Anderson once told me, he said, you know, how do you know if you're saved? He just says, do you love Christ? And if you've had that heart circumcised, that is it. It's not how perfect it is. How lo- do you love Christ? Or do you love all the ritual and all the externals? I, I, when I think of my, the, the, the letters L-A-U-R-A, they're only five letters, but when I, when I hear them or look at them, they mean the world to me. And so the five letters that spell Jesus, what it means to me is all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He circumcised my heart and caused me to love and trust in Christ alone. Galatians 5, 6, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything, (laughs) but faith working through love, believing the gospel and the obedience of faith that flows out of that. Galatians 6.15, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation, the new birth, the new heart. This is just from cover to cover. I hope you see it. And so as we close out this morning, by faith we are the people of God. In Colossians 2.11-12, through 12, it says, in, in him Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, the true one. And the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God. Here's the Spirit who raised him from the dead. So on the cross, I want you to hear that. That's an amazing statement. Jesus was cut off. He was circumcised. This said, it said the circumcision of Christ. He was cut off. And he was cut off. And he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Isaiah 53, he was cut off from the land of the living. He went under the knife and he got the curse that we deserve for our sin. And so I want you to get this. In him, you were circumcised, Paul said. In him, you get a new heart and a new life in Christ. And now you read the Sermon on the Mount and you see the beauty of a person who who loves God. Jesus came and fulfilled it. Don't be crushed by a standard, but believe. Believe in Jesus Christ and all the beauty of Him fulfilling the law and being put now to your account. In Christ, there's no condemnation. And in that, you will have a circumcised heart. A heart of stone will now be a heart of flesh. You'll have a new attitude toward the King and toward God for giving us His Son. A new attitude toward the law of Christ. That's now written in your heart. It's just so beautiful from the inside. Now I have a new heart from God by looking to Jesus alone. And I have a new, a new worship. Here's my heart, Lord. Take what is yours. I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. But the life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have a new heart and I, I, I died. And this new life is I, I live for the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the, the, the greatest miracle is to be able to get a new heart. And now to, to love, to love the law of Christ because I love Christ. There's, there's no more enmity. There's love 
And the greatest burden of a believer's heart is that I come short of loving him the way I want. And that's what glory is going to be. I'll finally be able to love him the way this new heart wants to forever. And I'll never have to confess sin ever again. And so I just thank God for the new heart. And I pray, don't die in ritual and external religion. Has he given you a new heart? Maybe today that, that issue could cause you to finally say, uncle, I can't create. I've tried in religion for 20 years and I can't get a heart for God. Let that today make you flee to Christ saying, I can't even give you my heart. My heart hates you. And come to him who are weary and heavy laden with trying to please him with a heart that doesn't love him. And he says, I'll give you rest for your soul. Let that drive you to Christ this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. There's so much more to say here, oh God, but I thank you for what is here. And I pray that every, everyone hearing this morning, anyone who has a new heart, by looking to Christ alone and what he's done to save us, and from that now bubbles up just love and desire to please him, to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. God, the obedience of faith. We thank you for it. I pray that we would treasure it. And God, I pray for the unbelievers, the, the ones who just, man, Superman bullets just keep bouncing off their chest. I pray today that your spirit went right into their heart and showed them what their heart really is. They can't change it. It's why they're so cold and they don't have passion and love and fire for Jesus Christ. It's just dead orthodoxy fake, false. Let them lift their eyes now and call upon Jesus and be saved, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ.